Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening. Uh, welcome to this Stockholm Environment Institute webinar, which is being held together with GIZ, the Climate and, Co uh, Climate and Clean Air Coalition, and UN Environment on this first United Nations International Day of Clean Air for Blue Skies. My name is Johan Schielenschena, and I am a research leader at the Stockholm Environment Institute, and I'm heading the work on air pollution. I would like to point out that this webinar is being recorded. This webinar focuses on the actions we need to take to address air pollution as we come out of the COVID crisis. We have seen what an important driver the health impacts of COVID-19 have been for strong national and international action and cooperation to solve that particular health issue. Today, we focus on the huge impacts that air pollution have on human health and with the large stimulus packages being discussed to recover from COVID-19, we need to grasp this opportunity to ensure that the investments are used to reduce emissions um, around the globe that lead to air pollution. But we don't just have a massive air pollution problem, we also have the climate crisis and we have agreed to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. Fortunately, there are solutions that can solve several issues at the same time. So we need to be smart and develop coherent strategies that can address multiple issues. Today, as well as holding this webinar, um, SEI and GIZ are also launching a policy brief on the importance of planning to reduce air pollution and climate change at the same time, which you can find on the SEI website. We have an excellent panel of speakers and have planned question and answer sessions as well. We have split the webinar into two parts with a Q&A session after each part. To put all this in, I'm going to have to be strict on timing and will remind speakers when they are nearing the end of their time. So let me introduce the speakers for the first session. First, we have Geraint Davis, uh, who is a member of the UK Parliament and chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Air Pollution. He will be followed by Professor Sir Andy Haynes from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Then we will listen to Helena Moline Valdez, who is, go who is the head of the CCAC Secretariat based at UN Environment in Paris. And the last speaker will be Dr. Eleni Iacovidou, who is a lecturer from Brunel University in London. I will introduce the, uh, the speakers in session two at the start of that session. For participants who are listening to this webinar, I would like to inform you that we have a Q&A function, which is in the top right hand corner of your screen. Please could you tell us who you are, which organisation you belong to in that, so we know for our information. Also, please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A as the webinar proceeds, and we will have staff from SEI as well as the speakers who will be responding as we go through the webinar. You can either ask an open question or target an individual speaker, but please state your organisation in the questions. And we're also going to use these questions to define, define which questions we will take up in the verbal Q&A session. So without further ado, um, we're going to now start with a film which has been produced um, by the All Party Parliamentary Group um, and Geraint has, has supplied to us. So please could we First have the film and then Geraint uh, Davis will um, present his thoughts um, afterwards. Over to the film now.
Well, behind that uh, very merry film are some fatal facts. 900,000 people this year have died from coronavirus. Seven million people are dying every year from air pollution. Millions and millions more will die from climate change, from forced migration, hunger and conflict. We're only one degree ahead of the 19th century uh, temperatures, but of course over Europe it's two degrees, over Arctic it's three degrees, which accounts for the fact that 850, 8,500 tonnes a second of ice are melting from Greenland. So we face a catastrophe in, in our lives and our children's lives. Uh, and so it's, it's great that we've got this opportunity to join the dots between COVID, uh, air pollution and climate change today. Because the reality is coronavirus uh, is increased in terms of its death rate by air pollution. We know from Harvard that they estimate something like 88% more deaths occur for one microgram of PM 2.5 per cubic meter, meter of air, something like 15% the research in the Netherlands suggests. So if we just reduced the amount from say 14 to 13 in London, we'd get 15% less deaths. We also know that increases the infection rate. As we've heard from Queen Mary's College, the ACE2 receptors in your nose and your throat, which take on COVID are accentuated in the event of air pollution and the particulates themselves may actually carry uh, the disease. So clearly we need a, a clean air strategy out of a lockdown. Um, and the question really that my group had asked is what does that look like? And in simple terms, as that film showed, firstly, it means working from home, not getting back in the car and going back into the office or to work as means encouraged, working for her from home, increasing connectivity, increasing uh, training, staggering work, reducing congestion, staggering entry into school, making school safer. It might be the case we should have six days uh, of school, four days per pupil, which would of course mean that two thirds of the pupils at any one time to uh, increase uh, social distancing. Uh, clearly, we don't want people idling outside schools. We want better indoor air quality in schools. We want more cycling. We want more pedestrianisation. We want more, not less, public transport, more frequent, more socially distanced, uh, like cleaner and with masks. We want private transport, the grid for electric, for hydrogen uh, sped up rather than held back by the fossil fuel industry. We want fossil fuel cars uh, banned by 2030 uh, at the very latest. We want scrappage schemes. We want fuel duty. People don't want fuel duty. We do need fuel duty alongside better public transport and scrappage schemes. We need green trains, green planes, green ships, as well as green cars. And we need less travel. We can do more work from home online. Do we really need HS2? I know it's a bit controversial, but do we need it? We need masks wherever people are assembled, in office, in work, at, at play, in school. Uh, we need re renewable energy, whether it's tidal, solar or wind. We need to ban wood and coal burning domestically. It accounts for 38 percent of PM 2.5. We want to impose World Health Organization limits in our legislation. 10 micrograms per cubic meter by 2030 should be in the environment bill. It isn't. Agriculture, we should reduce ammonia which uh, in fertilizer, which increases its own particulates. We should ban fracking. Fracking, 5 percent of the methane is leaked through fugitive emissions, methane 85 times worse than CO2 for global warning. It should be banned. Our carbon footprint in our consumption should be reduced by more local production, a less carbon intensive imports. We need a fiscal strategy in our budgets to focus on getting down uh, carbon. And we need... Um, you could wrap up now, Gary. No, I am wrapping up. Oh, good. Um, good. Uh, and, uh, uh, we need a, a strategy on indoor air quality as well, where we spend 90 percent of the time to actually get rid of the harmful uh, chemicals. We also need, need to get rid of microplastics. There should be a tax on plastics, target for aggregate production, air monitors outside every school to drive consumer opinion and a, a safe Brexit, which is Paris compliant. COP26 is Britain's chance to impose the idea of trade, which uh, puts carbon head and shoulders above everything else. I know I'm out of time. The world is out of time. So let's get together, save lives, save the planet and save our better future for all our children. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you very much for that rousing, uh, rousing speech there. Um, and so um, I'd like to pass quickly on to Professor Sarandi Haynes, um, if you could, and if you could take it on um, after that rousing speech from Garan. Yes, sure. Thanks very much, Johan. So I think uh, we've given a great in introduction by uh, Garan Davis, who's really very eloquently made the case for emerging from COVID along a healthy and zero carbon trajectory. What I'm going to do is to make the links between air pollution reduction, health and the sustainable development goals and the SDGs. Can I have the first slide, please? The SDGs and the next one. The SDGs are, of course, uh, a globally set, a global set of goals, 17 goals, 169 targets, which pretty well all the governments in the world have signed up to, although many of them have not pursued with the, with the intensity that they should have done. The SDGs help to frame the development agenda over coming, uh, the COVID coming decade to 2030. And of those SDGs, of course, number three, good health and well-being, um, is very much at the centre of them. But number three is very much about healthcare delivery. It doesn't mention air pollution, but it also focuses very much on healthcare delivery. But I want to make the case that many of the other SDGs are also vital for health, for sustainable development and for a low carbon future. So, for example, if we look at number two, goal two, that's about ending hunger, achieving food security. And of course, we know that climate change is a major threat to food security around the world because crop yields are going to decline as a result of climate change. So moving towards more sustainable diets, um, protecting uh, nature and using our land more responsibly is a vital part of climate change mitigation, and improving health. Next slide, please. Just uh, this slide just shows you how moving towards healthy dietary guidelines such as those specified by the WHO will result in a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, largely because of reduction in methane, because we consume large amounts of red meat and dairy products, which of course are associated with methane production. Um, vegetarian diets, of course, have a greater reduction, but it doesn't mean to say that we have to move totally towards vegetarianism. It, even a, somewhat of a reduction in um, red meat, for example, would have a substantial beneficial effect on me methane uh, production. Uh, and also increasing our intake of fruit and vegetables, nuts and seeds will also produce very major health benefits. Next slide. So when some work we've done on, on the UK diet shows that if we could um, follow the um, WHO nutritional guidelines, we could reduce uh, our per capita per head emissions uh, by about um, 300 kilograms per year of CO2 equivalent. That's largely methane, of course. And there would be a substantial benefit in terms of life expectancy, about eight months increase, something of that order, by eating more fruit and vegetables, somewhat less of, of uh, red meat and other, other sources. Uh, next slide. And then we've seen the Lancet Eat Lancet Commission, which has put forward its idea of a planetary health diet, uh, which they suggested could prevent 10 to 11 million premature deaths by mid-century, something like that, and lead to a sustainable global food system. And in that diet, they suggested we need to eat less animal source protein and less dairy, lots of whole grains and again, fruit and vegetables, um, certainly uh, 500 grams a day, probably more, 600 grams perhaps. Um, and uh, also much less uh, sugar, of course, as well. So the combination that they suggested could be tailored to different dietary patterns and different cultures and provides a kind of guideline towards which we can aim. Next slide. So SDG 3, as I've said, epitomizes and really focuses on universal health coverages, but also talks about reducing air pollution because it can cut child deaths and, of course, non-communicable disease deaths as well. Heart disease, stroke, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And as we've already heard, these are the kind of conditions that predispose to poor outcomes from COVID. So they increase the risk of death from COVID. Next slide, please. Uh, goal five is about achieving gender uh, equality and certainly in many parts of the world where solid fuels are still burnt um, uh, to generate uh, cooking for cooking purposes and so on. Uh, household uh, air pollution kills about 1.7, uh, 1.6 million people a year, something of that order. And also searching for the fuel exposes largely women to the risk of violence and also takes up a great deal of time. So moving towards clean fuels can have multiple benefits in the home. Next slide. And of course, goal seven is about uh, providing electricity access uh, to affordable, reliable, sustainable and modern energy for all. 
and that can um, reduce the premature deaths by several millions, as I'll show, I think, in the next slide. Next, please. So the next slide does show you indeed uh, the number of deaths that could be prevented from phasing out fossil fuel burning. We believe about 3.6 million deaths here, something of that order are related to the air pollution generated when we burn fossil fuels. And the map shows you where the benefits would be greatest over Asia, that's China, India, Europe, North America. Less so over Africa because they burn less fossil fuels, but if we include other sources like uh, agricultural burning, and like the uh, pollution that escapes from households, then there are substantial uh, deaths as well um, all, all around the world due to these various human related sources of, of air pollution. So there's a big health benefit if we move towards a zero carbon, uh, zero combustion economy. Next slide. One minute. And then finally, running out of time. Goal 11 is, of course, cities um, moving towards low carbon, uh, clean air cities, but also moving towards more active travel, which in addition to the air pollution benefits can also provide major physical activity, activity benefits as well. Next slide. I think I'll skip over that, but it basically shows that there'll be big benefits for diabetes and, and a whole range of other conditions related to sedentarism. And then finally, of course, Goal 15 is about promoting the sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems. And we also know that uh, probably several hundred thousand lives a year are uh, lost because of the uh, air pollution from forest burning and other types of landscape burning. So uh, protecting forest cover can reduce air pollution as well as having other uh, health benefits. So I'll, I'll stop there. Next slide, I think the final slide. Uh, yeah, so I'll stop there just by concluding that there are many benefits of moving towards a low carbon or zero carbon economy. And if you value, if you put economic values on those benefits, then they will, um, in many cases, offset totally the effects, the, the costs really of moving down a zero carbon strategy. So just to emphasize, as we come out of COVID, we should do so on a zero carbon strategy to reduce air pollution um, and protect health. Uh, and also uh, achieve the many economic and social benefits that we can do from moving it along that trajectory. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, so you, you've really eloquently talked about all of these linkages between these different sustainable development goals. Um, and now um, I would ask Helena Moline Valdez to emphasize the work that the Climate and Clean Air Coalition has done to try and integrate these issues. Helen, you need to unmute. Yes, hello, thank you. Thank you everybody for this excellent introductions. A lot has been said already. Uh, maybe I can just move quickly straight into my presentation. The, the purpose of integrated planning for air pollution and climate change is what we in the Climate and Clean Air Coalition has been advocating for since 2012. Uh, and it's on its on its uh, sharp edge right now during the pandemic, but it's also on its sharp edge because of the climate crisis. Next. So most of the air pollutants and greenhouse gases are co-emitted from the same sources. So therefore, air pollution and climate are two sides of the same coin. So it's very important that policymakers and we saw some excellent heard some excellent views from the uh, parliamentarian uh, who who opened this meeting, it's important to look at both um, impacts and benefits from pollu air pollutants and greenhouse uh, gases because of these sources. And an integrated approach to climate and clean air action can allow us to then, at the one hand, assess the net impact of the change in emissions on global temperature and local air quality. Uh, we can also quantify the multiple public health and agriculture impacts benefits of those changes that Andy Haynes was talking about right now. We will have the benefit of hearing a presentation about this methodology by both Chris and our colleagues in Mexico. Next. So when it comes to uh, the pathways that we chose, we are really on an unsustainable path still. Um, and we were so even before the pandemic hit us, 
During lockdown, we celebrated in some some places uh, blue skies for the first uh, time since very long, like in the Himalayas and many of the cities of Europe and, and around the world. Um, but without transformational changes, these emissions are quickly returning. And when we look at the the needs and the unsustainability of the path we have right now, we are already in 1.2 degrees warming since pre-industrial times, while we need to stay way below 2 degrees and towards 1.5 degrees. So we are almost at the threshold already. 7 million premature deaths per year from air pollution is uh, our normal <laughs> number, let's say. Um, and the climate change and the burden of the seas from pollution continue to be the most important environmental threat that our species faces today. Ozone pollution, smog, black carbon uh, uh, and co-pollutants are, well, especially this, the, the ozone is impacting more than 100 million tons of crops every year, which jeopardize the food security coming back to Andy Haynes' connection to the sustainable de development goals. And this, of course, is something that needs to be upfront during the recovery policies right now uh, in the stimulus programs. Uh, um, implementation and connection between health, air pollution, climate and the environment. Next. So we know the solutions and the technologies. Uh, it's also about lifestyle and, and choices. But it's not enough with lifestyle and choices from individuals. It's really about systemic changes of industry, of energy sources to more towards uh, and, 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 and uh, towards renewable energy uh, and many other things. It's also about being prepared in advance to improve public health systems everywhere, work on addressing vulnerabilities and inequalities, uh, which is, of course, part to define the sustainable path we need. If you look at this graph, which is our CCAC, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition's uh, fund, uh, let's say it's our framework and fundament that we stand on, it's not enough. Of course, we should not do uh, business as usual. It will lead us to a temperature increase that goes three, four, even five degrees um, above pre-industrial levels. It's also not enough to focus only on those pollutants that are short-lived in the in in the atmosphere, like methane, which is methane is 40% almost of the global forcing uh, after after CO2, with tropospheric ozone uh, and um, black carbon. It's not enough. It's not enough to do one or the other. We have to do all of it, and we have to do it fast. It's about avoiding. Um, the tipping points here, tipping points both when it comes to public health impacts, but most importantly, what this graph is showing us is the temperature uh, that can lead us to catastrophic um, uh, tipping points. So next, I'm trying to be very short because there is much to say about all of this. So what we really want, which path will we take? What we really want to achieve is what Andy Haynes said. We want to achieve sustainable development for all, clean air for all and sustainable development for all. So by selecting a pathway and and having the tools to model what those pathway we look at uh, in, in, in terms of rate of emissions could lead us to either uh, a rate of millions of deaths and losing millions on ton, of tons of crop yields in the next few decades, which is the upper upper scenario, or we can have a lot to be gained by moving down to the lower trajectory and, and it's much better uh, changes to achieve many societal goals if we take these decisions in an integrated way in terms of planning and implementation. So this is why we recommend to choose this pathway of multiple benefits and integrated benefits for all. Next one. Could you wrap up now? please? Yes, I will wrap up now quickly. So addressing poor air quality and climate change. Uh, we can go to next one actually immediately. I wanted to quote our Secretary General Antonio Guterres and my uh, UNEP uh, director, executive director Inger Anderson, who just spoke in an event just recently. 
but we can talk about this later because it's really about getting rid of fossil fuels, looking at cities, etc. We can talk about that uh, later today. So to wrap up on the Climate and Clean Air Coalition support to integrated planning, this is an initiative that we have now been able to, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition has grown from six countries to, to 70 countries and we are now in hundreds of participating agencies and, and NGOs. We have been working with 70 countries to help them in this integrated planning. And, and the final, final slide, please. And by working together uh, in coordinated ways, we hope to use also this Clean Air Day that is today, the 7th of September every day, to start to use this as a milestone to share information beyond countries, cities and, and agencies around the world. There is no, uh, as we know, there is no global framework for clean air and air quality except for uh, in the UNECE region. Is this something we can achieve together uh, through integrated planning and through political decisions moving forward? Thank you, Johan. Thank you very much, Helena. So there are many linkages between you know, climate and clean air and also with the SDGs. And I would like to now ask uh, Dr. Eleni Iacovidou um, if she could make a link then to um, other aspects as well. So Eleni, would you please um, give your presentation? Thank you for the introduction. Uh, yeah, so I, I'd like to make the link of all these great things that you've mentioned, the previous speakers mentioned in regards to clean air and pollution to the issue of plastics and plastic waste. So if we move to the next slide, we'll see that the, the, the plastics are used in, in many applications and the, the biggest uh, uh, application is the is the plastic packaging that is uh, used to transport different products and goods to us such as food and liquids and other goods and recently the COVID-19 pandemic highlighted how dependent we are on plastic uh, components and products because these plastics have been used in, in the production of personal protection equipment in the uh, production of other medical devices that are used to protect people as well as in shielding uh, people in the various services that we are using in, in terms of protecting us uh, from uh, getting the virus. So if the plastic is such a useful material with so many applications that is flowing in our market, what's the problem with this material? It, it offers so many benefits. So why can we, uh, how does it contribute to the air pollution? And the next slide shows that relationship between the extraction and use and the management uh, stages involved in the in the plastics life cycle that actually gives us an indication of where the problem is. The problem is everywhere is on the making, on the use and the management of the plastic uh, waste uh, that is produced in our system. Why? Because uh, they contribute to greenhouse gas emissions and eventually to climate change. For example, in a st recent study by Shen et al, they suggested that the uh, production of uh, crude oil and its refinery process in order to produce plastic polymers, plastic uh, polymeric resins that is used in the plastic making, contributes to 68 million tons of CO2 equivalent. And that gives you an indication of how big the problem is. And then we go into the um, transportation of these polymeric resins into the uh, manufacturing processes and then the various products into our economies. And then we have the production of plastic waste. And that's where uh, the problems begin again, because uh, the way that we are disposing this uh, plastic um, material is important as well as the management. In the developed world we have recycling, we have incineration with or without energy recovery and we have landfilling, all of which contribute in their own way to the climate change impacts depending on what kind of technologies we have. But that's where the, the issue is. Uh, in the developed countries, we may have some technologies in order to uh, uh, ameliorate a little bit how much greenhouse gases are emitted into the atmosphere during the management of plastic waste. 
uh, when we don't have the infrastructure to deal with uh, the the material, the plastic waste uh, components that we don't, uh, we can recycle. What would what do we do? We ship them to other countries. And the next slide shows that uh, the material, the plastic waste uh, that we do not process in developed countries, is shipped to Southeast uh, uh, Asian countries for recycling. But that's, that's a misguided recycling process. That's where major problems occur that contribute to air pollution, because these countries to where we shipped our plastic waste for recycling don't always have the infrastructure and capacity to deal with our plastic waste. And often they resort to uh, dumping these waste to landfills that are not controlled. And thus we have the slow degradation of plastic waste materials that release uh, toxic pollutants to the atmosphere or most likely they burn the plastic and the next picture shows uh, the magnitude of the problem. The next slide shows that we have this open burning that takes place for plastic waste that is in the form of uh, packaging. For example, imagine uh, bottles, pots, trays and tops that are burning these open dump sites, but we also have the burning of plastic components that are retrieved from the um, electrical and electronic equipment, for example, and these are heavy in additives and other pollutants, which when the plastic is burned, is really, they are released in the atmosphere and contribute to uh, the greenhouse gases and, and climate change. And then, we, of course, we have the litter that is slowly degrading into the environment, releasing uh, harmful substances. And finally, what I'm trying to get at is that via the next slide is that what we really need to do is to to think about how we can change uh, that uh, picture. How can we manage and retain the plastic materials that we uh, depend on in our economy for longer? And that's where a systems based approach can help us to understand where interventions can be made in order to mitigate the, but the harmful impacts of these materials in our economy and how we can maximize the value that we can um, capture from uh, the plastic materials uh, that we uh, placed in our system. Thank you very much, Elaine. That was very interesting. So um, we have a, a, a number of questions that have been posted and we have some and there are some things that really, um, you know, I, I, I thought were very interesting. Um, so I, I'd like to ask a question first of um, Geraint. So um, you represent people in Wales um, relatively contributing a small amount to climate change. Now, do you think that the story of air pollution and health can generate enough critical mass to mobilize the support we need to help all the other different goals, including the Paris Agreement? Do you feel, Geraint, that, um, you know, this interest in health is, is a, a turning point in terms of um, getting people to be interested or not? Yeah, I mean, I think people are reviewing the way they live uh, and they will respond in sentiment to clean out we're out of out of uh, lockdown, but I think the essential thing is not to blame people and expect too much of people, but to recognise that governments have all the levers to provide a fiscal framework to make people do things. If you, for instance, tax, as we've just heard, if you tax plastics, so the cost of a plastic bottle is twice, three times as much, people might use them more often and they'd use sustainable alternatives. If you increase the cost of uh, fossil fuel to drive uh, and subsidise public transport, they would do that. Uh, instead, the government just stands back and says, do the right thing. And it's simply not good enough. We spend more on fossil fuel subsidy than the entire GDP of the UK and France combined. It's simply not sustainable. So uh, uh, talking about doing the right thing, Andy, I was wondering if you could expand on on some of those solutions that provide multiple benefits. And I was I was kind of interested in the slide that you didn't have time to to um, present on. Um, do you think you could look at those some of those solutions that you're alluding to for hitting all of these different sustainable development goals? 
Well, one, of course, is, is cities. I mean, we're seeing a lot of activity at the sub-national level. Um, a lot of mayors, for example, with a lot of ambition to decarbonize their city economy as much as they can and also capitalize on the health benefits of doing that. So in cities, for example, there are a number of strategies you, you can implement. Some of them we've already heard about. Obviously, active travel is a great way to get people exercising. We know about, on a global scale, over 5 million people a year die of uh, essentially lack of exercise, of sedentary lifestyle. And really the only way to get people active on a mass basis is by walking and cycling. Attending the gym, of course, isn't going to work. It's not going to be sustained. So public transport, people have to walk to the bus stop, walk to the, to the tube station or whatever. Walking and cycling are essential real components of any kind of recovery strategy. And I think we are seeing a number of cities around the world now prioritizing uh, the emergence of walking and cycling. And what you need to do to get people who've not walked and cycled very much before is to make it safe to do so. And that means making the air cleaner, uh, but also reducing the risks, the, the risk of accidents and so on. So these are things that city policymakers can do. We also know that there's a lot that can be done in terms of the built environment. So in housing, for example, you know, our houses are extremely inefficient. So by retrofitting housing, that could provide major job opportunities as well as reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And we've shown that if you did that in the case of the UK, if you retrofitted our obsolete housing stock, you could probably prevent a, a several thousand premature deaths a year from reduced uh, pollution levels in the house, as well as less cold and so on. Uh, but you have to take into account, if you just seal up houses, you can actually increase the level of air pollution in them. So you actually have to have a combination of insulation, uh, with the double, treble glazing and uh, better ventilation. So these are just some examples of some of the things that you could do with a determined government that was uh, really aimed to capitalise on some of the multiple benefits from decarbonising the economy. Yeah, so I'm, I'm also struck by, um, Eleni, your um, presentation, which which really asked us to rethink our approaches, you know, so you're looking at the drivers and, and some of the solutions to multiple problems as well. Now, um, as it says in the Q&A, do you, do you believe that these linkages have enough visibility? Can it help to emphasize the air pollution angle of plastic waste as well as all the other things? Um, perhaps you could expand on that. I don't think they have enough visibility and I don't think that people, I think that the climate action movement, for example, is very much focused on the impact of, of climate change. And it's a little bit of, I come from Sweden and I was there not long ago and I could see all this shaming and blaming and it's a lot, and there is a lot of, of fear about the future. So I think there is less there is less emphasis on what we can actually do to change. And as has been said by previous speakers, it's obviously not so much what an individual can achieve alone, but it's definitely what an individual can achieve by putting pressure on policymakers and also be aware of these connections of, of uh, climate health and other benefits. What does it mean when I burn my waste? How much waste do we all generate individually that we could avoid? How much do we recycle and compost to reduce both the waste, um, the waste mountain and at the same time by not either burning or, or uh, releasing the biogas and methane that is the result of, of organic waste? I don't think people in general realize what it takes and, and also, I think we need to focus our attention a lot on uh, what's possible, what the solutions are and, and what the opportunities are. Uh, from trash to, to treasure, for example, uh, that kind of messages and, and the lifestyle changes that, that, that we heard about before when it comes to, to food, etc. So a little bit less catastrophic uh, scare because people get paralyzed as well. It seems so catastrophic that maybe we can't do anything at all about it. So by bringing in some of those multiple uh, benefits and, and clear messages on what we indeed can do, and then put that pressure on policymakers and understand when, uh, when, when some of the decisions are taken that might put some, some constraints on our movement, let's say the 15 minute city, 
uh, would be fantastic to live in a city where the city dwellers could walk or, or move around in public transport and be able basically to solve their issues within a range of 15 minutes. This is something that Paris, where I'm now living, is trying to achieve. And the mayor here gets a lot of heat because of this, because then, of course, there are some trade-offs always. So by 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 proposing these proactive solutions and having a movement of, of people um, behind it, uh, because there is a positive um, personal gain, basically, for a global and, and local uh, political direction to take. So that's what I think is still missing and we can do a little bit more as as either as activists but also as scientists, as, as advocates and as the United Nations of course to, to try to really put emphasis on what works and what it takes to make it happen. And now is a great mo moment where we can either go one way or the other from the brown and the green. Let's say we have this multiple billions and trillions of money that is now going to be reinvested into the economy after this lockdown period. Uh, and, and I don't see uh, immediately how this will lead us to a better future if there is not a lot of pressure making it happen and, and showcasing what what the multiple benefits look like. Thank you very much, Helena. Um, and I was just finally, um, Eleni Iacovidou, who um, perhaps this this idea of a systems thinking. Do you feel that there there is enough um, systems thinking going on, or do you think there is uh, this this could be a, a game changer if we highlight those aspects? That's a very good question, and I think that uh, there is. Um, people have started looking at uh, system-based approaches, which is really great. But we need to be careful that we don't repeat the same mistakes as we did with the circular economy that has turned out to be something as of uh, more like a model rather than um, a, a pathway to a better future. So this systems based approach is the only way to help us see how one intervention at the production, let's say part of the system can impact the uh, what happens at the management step of the system. So how does design of plastics, for example, can help us retain that material in the economy for longer without necessarily uh, impacting on, on humans, on the environment, on the economy as well? So it's about uh, using the systems-based approach to promote sustainable development as the ultimate goal and the sustainable circular economy as uh, far as it is possible to be achieved. Well, thank you very much. So what I'd like to do now is to move to the second part of our um, webinar. So here um, I'd like to introduce a few more speakers um, for the second session. Um, we will start with um, Dr. Chris Malley, who is a colleague of mine at Stockholm Environment Institute, who is a, re a senior research fellow at SCI York Centre at University of York. He will be followed by Dr. Luis Gerardo Ruiz Suarez from the National Institute of Ecology and Climate Change, ENEC in Mexico. We will then listen to Yuan de Awe, uh, a senior environmental engineer at the World Bank. And finally, we will have Dr. Sarah West, um, who is the SEI York Centre Director at the University of York. And we will then have a chance to have more questions and answers. And I would um, like to ask all panelists to um, to be answer any of, of the questions which are posed in the Q&A and to anyone listening to use the Q&A function to put forward any ideas or questions you have for the people um, who are speaking today. Um, then uh, finally we will have some reflections from Dr Patrick Bucher of GIZ and I'll close the session. So could I ask um, Chris Malley, could you um, make your presentation please? Thank you very much, Johan, and, and thank you very much. It's very nice to um, be here. We've heard a lot about the health impacts that air pollution has and very clearly from Helena about the opportunity of linking air pollution and climate change. In my presentation, I'd like to talk a bit about how the Climate and Clean Air Coalition supporting national action and planning or SNAP initiative is working directly with national governments to try and operationalize and achieve the air pollution and climate change um, benefits. 
I want to summarise this opportunity in, in one slide that I think is really effective on, on, on the next slide, on one figure, sorry. This is research from the European Commission Joint Research Centre that shows that if we take action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in a way that is consistent with the Paris Agreement target of two degree, degrees, the associated reduction in air pollutant emissions will avoid over a million premature deaths by 2050. With current emission reduction pledges in nationally determined contributions, we're on course for about 300,000 avoided premature deaths. So really our mission, our goal in the SNAP initiative is to get as close to that blue line or even higher um, in terms of maximizing the air pollution benefits that can come from achieving the long-term temperature targets outlined in the Paris Agreement. Um, on the next slide, we talk about how we achieve this. We achieve this by trying to build capacity within national institutions for planning on reduction in air pollution and climate change mitigation. There are over 30 countries who are involved in the uh, SNAP initiative of the CCAC at the moment, and each of those countries have finalized and endorsed national action plans to reduce air pollutants and, and, and greenhouse gases or to reduce short-lived climate pollutants. And in this round of revisions to climate change commitments in the lead up to the uh, COP in Glasgow in 2021, we're working with 10 countries to enhance their climate change mitigation ambition through actions that directly improve air pollution locally. Um, I'd like to talk about three of the factors that I think are important in increasing action in uh, countries on integrated air pollution and climate change mitigation. These aren't exhaustive, but I think are, are useful and, and are things that have been um, uh, useful in the countries where we're working. On the next slide, the first one is providing quantitative evidence of the potential benefits of different policies and measures that reduce emissions and, and of greenhouse gases and air pollutants. SEI's low emission analysis platform tool has been extensively applied to estimate emissions of greenhouse gases and of air pollutants um, in, for future scenarios, for the implementation of different policies and measures. And with support from the CCAC over the last five years, we've extended this tool to allow you to look at those emission scenarios and quantify the benefits in terms of reduction in air pollutant in PM 2.5 exposures and benefits for human health, um, benefits in terms of reduction in global average temperature change. And that has meant that um, national institutions have been able to develop their plans and summarize them in key statistics. The next slide shows um, Ghana's national action plan to reduce short-lived climate pollutants. It includes 15 specific mitigation measures that they are taking, including those included in their nationally determined contribution. The implementation of these 15 mitigation measures were estimated to avoid 2,500 premature deaths by 2030 from reductions in outdoor air pollution exposure to reduce the um, crop yield loss from air pollution exposure by 40%. It's not just um, human exposure to air pollution that has impacts, it also is important for food security. And to reduce Ghana's contribution to global temperature increases by 55%. Providing this quantitative evidence of the impacts and benefits of these integrated air pollution and climate change plans helps to achieve the second key factor shown on the next slide, which is building a coalition of support for taking these actions. And I think the Maldives, the work that they've done in developing their first action plan on air pollutants provides an excellent example of this. The graph on the left, the, green, the dark green line, shows that by implementing the Maldives climate change mitigation commitments, they could reduce PM 2.5 emissions across the Maldives by 35%. But this allowed them to then identify the additional actions over and above what they had already committed to on climate change, which was mainly actions on land and marine uh, transport that could further reduce emissions. And by demonstrating these benefits from taking action in the transport sector, uh, our colleagues in the Ministry of Environment in the Maldives jointly launched and endorsed this plan 
um, with the Minister of Environment on the left of that picture and the Minister of Transport on the right of that picture. The third key factor that I want to highlight today, shown on the next slide. Oh, no, sorry, I'm going to stick with this key factor for a moment and just highlight Nigeria's National Action Plan on Air Pollution, but still on this slide. Thank you. And, and just to highlight that in Nigeria's National Action Plan on Air Pollution, which is estimated to avoid 7,000 premature deaths per year, whilst achieving half of their climate change commitment under their NDC, it is One now being jointly death. implemented by three institutions, by the Ministry of Budget and National Planning and the Cabinet Office, as well as the Ministry of Environment. And this is because it's been demonstrated that this plan directly contributes to the six criteria in Nigeria's National Development Plan. The final factor that I want to highlight on the next slide is getting high level political, political endorsement and commitment to action. When we think back of that opportunity of reducing a million premature deaths by 2050 by achieving the Paris target, we receive a lot of encouragement about actually being able to do that in the real world from the nationally determined contributions that are being published this year in this cycle of NDC commitments. Chile has committed to reduce greenhouse gases with a vision for full decarbonisation by 2050. But they're in their NDC that was submitted in April. They made a second commitment to reduce black carbon emissions by 25% by 2030, specifically because of the air pollution and climate change benefits that can result from that. And particularly the air pollution benefits from from low income people who are cooking using in biomass and and uh, using biomass for, for heating in their homes. And the encouraging thing about Chile's NDC commitment is that in the analysis they did, the most cost effective mitigation measures like um, like um, electric heating in homes and electrification of the vehicle fleet um, were those that can achieve the air pollution reductions. Wrap up, please. Thank you. There are many other examples of this. And for anybody interested in finding out more about how NDCs can be enhanced um, through actions to reduce air pollution, I would encourage you to look at this guidance document that outlines four specific opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Now, I'd like, I'd like to turn to Dr. Luis Gerardo Ruiz Suarez from ENEC in Mexico, where a lot of policy has been implemented. Um, so, um, uh, Luis Crowder, could you please uh, present your talk? Yes. This uh, one, please. Or do I share? If you, if you um, ask for the next slide to be changed, I'll do that for you. Yes, please. Next slide. Next slide, please. OK, here. M I'm going to show you um, a success story about uh, air pollution mitigations uh, and with 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 uh, impacts on health and also some impacts on 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 climate change. Here in, in 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 this figure we have the maximum value of on daily ozone in in Mexico City in in, in the metropolitan area of Mexico City from the 1990 to the 2020 in the in, in this axis, axis uh, we have uh, the different uh, air quality management programs and different actions. The, the black line is uh, when we activate the level of, of, of concentration needed to activate the, uh, the contingency program that implies restrictions on mobility and some uh, activities that had, had been going down uh, with time. On, on, on the little table, we have the health benefits. Uh, we have due to, ah, sorry, I'm not showing the precursors for ozone, but they also show, they also had to, to decrease to get to get this uh, uh, trend in ozone. Uh, in, in PM 2.5, uh, from 1990 to 2015, and there was an 18.2 thousand avoided uh, uh, premature deaths um, due to PM 2.5 and due to ozone 4.1 thousand, total 22.3 thousand 
um, avoid that. Uh, but, uh, and also, we have another um, welfare benefit, and that is the increase in life expectancy um, for at birth, for PM10, 2.5, 1.3, also 1.9, total 3.2 years. Um, and for adults that, that already spend part of their life in, in, in a high pollution city, um, a modest gain, 0.8 years for each one of these pollutants. So that's 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 the success. But it's not even. I'm showing you the the, the mean values, but, but but the variability is quite hard because it depends on where you live and uh, and how do you move around the city. Next, please. Here here is a, a, the result of a, a study on the uh, using using this um, system of, of um, life cycle approach. The estimated carbon footprint footprint during use about 50 years of a house of new income law of new low income housing in Mexico for larger cities and the megalopolis for larger cities is about 40 percent of the total carbon footprint is due to the use of transport uh, smaller cities have a 70 percent and that's and that's uh, and also it means that they spend a lot of their income on that uh, on, 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 on transport, uh, working class people spend a, a lot of a, a lot of uh, their income on that, and you see the the other uh, energy use, electricity, and even cooking it is it's almost impossible to see it in the in the, in the in the bars. Yes, so there is a, a lot of work to do. Next, please. Here is a, another study in which I, I, I participated in these two. In these two studies, uh, I have the fortune to, to be in there. Uh, he, on the left, we have a, a, a exposure a, a study of a personal exposure study in one, along one street in the south part of Mexico. And we see uh, walking, walking uh, um, the exposure of walking. And yellow is in one way and, and orange is in the, in, in the same street uh, in the opposite way. Walking, cycling, public buses, a common car, gasoline car, and an hybrid with air conditioning. So these are the, the dots are the maximum values. Mm, cycling, you are more exposed to that because um, there is not a separate lane uh, uh, um, for cycling. And also, but anyway, some studies say that, and uh, despite of that, and there is a gain on, on cycling. But the, but the point is, nobody goes cycling or walking if they if the trip if the trip to work and takes two hours. <laughs> you have to go. People will take public transport, uh, cars. And sometimes people change of to um, both to metro and then to, and then to another another way of moving in, in, in from 1920 from from 2000 to 2010 the census data show that the distance to work increased in average in the megalopolis one kilometer one way so it is two kilometers one way and back but there are 10 million one way trips to work 20 million 20 million, so that means 20 million kilometers per day extra. One minute. Yeah, OK. Next, please. So uh, that means people people has to spend too, mo too much time in, 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 in public transport. We need to address that. Some integrated policy that we are uh, uh, taking is we are there is a, com a commitment to reduce black carbon. In the indices, the general law on climate change includes greenhouse gases and short lived climate pollutants. And short, climate, short lived climate pollutants are explicitly included in programs and institutes for mitigation. There is a push in the public service to integrate air quality and climate programs at subnational level, and also the urban development and the ecological land use programs uh, and, and to integrate or at least harmonize them. And then uh, we have uh, some efforts to compilate joint criteria pollutants and greenhouse gases emissions inventories because we think that it is key to, to integrated planning. 
And we are starting efforts to include experimental monitoring to validate greenhouse gases, solid climate pollutants and precursors as part of, of our MRB on climate, on climate and air quality programs. And if I have a, a half a minute, uh, pollution also impacts on people, on, on, on crops, not only people, and on, 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 in the central part of Mexico, these, these are the loss of uh, on crop yields due to ozone exposure, and some, some of them have about 25% loss, so we need also to address that. So, thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Gerardo, for, for giving us that uh, snapshot of what's going on in Mexico City. But um, we do have other um, success stories in other parts of the world. And so I would ask uh, Yuande uh, Awe from the World Bank to, to please give your presentation. And you may have to unmute yourself. Yes, thank you, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today to participate in this um, seminar on behalf of the World Bank. Um, so as requested, I will be presenting on um, uh, financial examples of financial support, successful cases of financial support for air quality management and climate change mitigation, and um, how come it is that the bank has become the um, world's leading financier of air quality management and climate change mitigation interventions worldwide. Um, so I will start um, by presenting some successful cases. Um, next. Yes. And first of all, it's important to understand why as an institution, the World Bank is interested in the topic of air quality management and climate change into uh, man, uh, mitigation. And that's because the poor populations, the poor, poorer segments of um, society are usually the ones who carry the heaviest burden of this. And uh, you can see that the number of deaths are higher um, in the low income countries at um, low income levels. Next. Next, next. You have to do, click this one. Twice. Yes, thank you. Oh, yes, thank you. So here, this is a, a, a chart which uh, is from India, and it basically shows the distributional impacts of air pollution. And as you can see, the low income groups are the ones that carry, carry the um, heaviest health burden, even though they have the lowest emissions, they also spend the largest part of their incomes on um, energy. So it's, it's a very inequitable problem in different parts of the world that you can see. Next. At a global level, uh, the bank did a study recently which shows that the cost of health damages, mortality and morbidity associated with um, ambient air pollution alone cost um, $5.7 trillion, which is equivalent to about 4.8% of global GDP. Next. So what is the bank doing? What are we doing um, to help our clients? Um, we have four different types of products that are listed here. We have analytical work and technical assistance, um, lending products for investments, for supporting policy reforms, and we also have what is called programs for results. Um, we work across different sectors of the economy in as much as they um, have a relationship with um, air pollution and climate change. Next. Um, in the past two decades or so, uh, lending and technical assistance um, that the bank has used to support its clients has been valued at over $52 billion. And this includes about $14 billion just targeting air pollution. About 50% of the climate change projects also have air pollution um, co-benefits. Next. Next. So what have our um, clients achieved? Really, our role as a bank is to support our clients. They are the ones who achieve these um, results. And as you can see here, um, in different cities across the world, um, there have been countries that have achieved significant improvements in air quality, different time frames, of course, and I'll dwell a little bit more on that in the next slides. Next. In Mexico City, um, as you can see here, 
um, GDP was growing, economic growth over uh, the period 1989 to 2016, you can see that GDP was on the increase. And even as GDP was on the increase, um, air quality was improving. So next slide, please. Next slide. Yes. And in that same period, Mexico City was able to reduce um, ambient concentrations of particulate matter by 70%. Um, in this same period. So it shows that um, achieving growth and reducing air pollution are not at loggerheads. They are both achievable. Thank you. Next slide. In Lima, Peru as well, um, over this period 2003 to 2012, in the Lima Callao area, which used to be a very um, highly polluted area, um, the government was able to reduce air pollution by 50% in Lima Callao. Um, and the bank was able to um, help the government with some analytical work that looked at different interventions for addressing air pollution. Next. In China, the results have also been very impressive. This is from the Jingjingji um, region of China, where um, the government was able to achieve about a 40% reduction of PM 2.5 over a five year uh, period. Next. Mongolia as well, we've had very impressive uh, results by the government. Prior to 2009, the concentrations were well above 200 micrograms uh, per cubic meter, and those have been significantly reduced um, just even below 100 um, in terms of the annual averages. Next. So what have we learned in all of this um, in supporting our clients? One thing that we've learned for sure is that our policy operations help. Um, they are effective in helping countries to achieve um, reductions in air pollution. Of course, the time frames may vary, and so it's very important for um, the, uh, the resources and the investments to be made to achieve the results. The bank can provide financing and knowledge, but it's also important that a country invest its own resources in achieving the results. Next. Um, we've learned that we need to do more faster and better in terms of investments, supporting monitoring, analytical work and information dissemination, and also in helping countries to strengthen public policies and undertake institutional reforms. Next. Next. Half a minute left. You Sorry? Want. Half a minute left. You want. Okay. So one area that we know that we need to do a lot of work is in the area of monitoring. In sub-Saharan Africa, this is a, part, a, a priority for the bank because of the dearth of, of monitoring. Next. Next. In terms of policies, um, some of the policies that we know that work include um, removing subsidies to pollution and taxes on uh, externalities. Next. We, we know that um, fiscal policies can phase out regressive subsidies that promote pollution. Next. Next. We also want to intensify training, dissemination for air quality management. Next. We need to do more also with respect to information dissemination to help to strengthen constitutions and um, constituencies and um, social accountability for air quality management. And we hope that we can also learn from some of the experience, for example, with awareness raising and development of responses to addressing marine pollution. Next. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, th there were some very positive messages there, um, but also an awful lot to, to do. But I think that this um, this issue of uh, air pollution affecting the poor, that's something that the next speaker is going to focus on as well. So Sarah, would you please uh, give your presentation? Yeah, thanks, Johan. So um, I'm Sarah West. I'm the Centre Director at SEI York. And I've been working for the last 12 years on bringing diverse voices into research and decision making. As we've heard so far, there's great work going on changing national and international policy around air pollution. But we need to remember to talk to people on the ground in society. Um, next slide, please. To better understand how policies may affect them, how their behaviours um, will influence the intended policy outcomes and how to ensure that we support the most vulnerable in society. And in SEI, we've developed inclusive approaches to develop solutions that work for many stakeholders and have all the co-benefits that we've already been hearing about. 
So I'm going to talk about two pieces of work in particular, one working with residents of Makuru in formal settlement in Nairobi and the other working in Kampala and Nairobi. These are both collaborative pieces of work with SEI York, Africa and Stockholm staff working together with researchers from Kenya and the UK, with NGOs, government officials and community members. Next slide, please. Over the past five years, SEI has built a network of researchers, practitioners and community members who have been exploring air pollution in Makuru informal settlement, monitoring exposure to air pollution using citizen science approaches and conducting mini projects to better understand people's lived experiences of air pollution and begins to develop solutions to it. Next slide, please. We used workshops, interviews, storytelling, participatory mapping, theatre and music to explore people's experiences of air pollution. Through these approaches, we, that is researchers and community members, uncovered high levels of exposure to air pollution and gained an understanding of the complexity of the challenges in the settlement. An example of this is the drainage channels in Makuru. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, which were named by questionnaire respondents as a source of air pollution. At first, we didn't understand why, but through the research, we found that the extremely poor water and sanitation provision in the settlements means that these channels are filled with rubbish from homes, including bags containing human feces, which is causing high levels of ammonia. Lack of official waste collection, next slide please, leads to burning of waste in unofficial dump sites. A policy to ban waste burning could be introduced, which would reduce the high levels of particulate matter pollution seen in these areas. But then what would happen to the waste? Using approaches such as Forum Theatre, next slide please, which brought together, what brought together local policymakers, other stakeholders and community members allowed us to explore these complex issues in a direct but non-confrontational way. Our first project in Makuri sparked the creation of the Kenya Air Quality Network, a forum to bring together policymakers, researchers and other stakeholders to improve air quality in Kenya and findings from these projects fed directly into that group. Next slide please. The second work I want to highlight is where we have been develop, delivering the co-benefits of improving air quality, urban mobility and road safety. Here we worked in Kampala and Nairobi to include marginalised and vulnerable groups in decision making. Here again, we used a mixture of creative participatory approaches, um, thank you, um, to explore these issues. So for example, 3D visualisations, um, arts and storytelling, amongst other things, to engage children, non-motorised transport users, including women and the elderly, matatu or minibus drivers and shopkeepers, to co-design road safety improvements. Next slide, please. In Kampala, we worked closely with the Kampala City authority and gained permission to install Africa's first 3D pop-up zebra crossing outside a school to highlight to motorised vehicles the need to be aware of pedestrians and slow down. And in Nairobi we generate d demonstrated methods including 3D models and next slide please, place making events how the busy Lathihi street could be improved in order to provide space for different road users. And working with a range of stakeholders in these ways, we are able to demonstrate how the street could look and function in order to improve mobility, health and safety and bring economic benefits to local businesses. And the Mayor of Nairobi approved the redevelopment. Next slide, please. This reduced congestion and improved air quality. Next slide, please. And as can be seen by this slide showing data of particulate matter over the course of the week with the lower lines showing the area around the improvement and the blue top line representative of what the street was like pre-traffic calming. In addition, it improved mobility through the busy CPD, CBD, segregated pedestrian and cycling lanes, which in turn provided additional road safety measures. Next slide, please. Also, the shopkeepers said that they had seen an increase in footfall as people were able to access their shops more easily. In short, the creative and participatory approaches we use at SEI have enabled us to better understand people's lived experiences of air pollution, to co-develop solutions which have worked for multiple stakeholders and can deliver important co-benefits. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. So um, I think there's been some fascinating um, talks here and um, I think it's clear also that air pollution is really becoming a social justice issue. It would seem that the poor will be more affected in the future uh, more affected both by air pollution and climate change and um, whilst rich countries are sorting out air pollution poorer countries have high levels or they're increasing i was just wondering if i could just ask a general question about what what do you think we need to do 
more of to ensure that poor people are not going to be suffering air pollution in the future. I was wondering if I could first ask uh, Yuande if you have a, uh, any ideas of, you know, what, what are the most important things to ensure that the sort of people who are um, the poorest in, in, in the world don't suffer air pollution? Well, I'll, I'll start with two very basic things. One is there is a need to really understand just how bad the problem is where these people are. And what you find is that is in that most low income countries, there is no monitoring. So there is no understanding of just how bad the problem is. So that's 101, ground zero for addressing the problem of air pollution where poor people are affected. Another thing would be um, just improving on um, public awareness of the problem. In as much as the problem exists and it is a cause of death, it's a big, um, a huge economic burden, many people still are not aware of how it affects their health directly. And so I think um, improving, strengthening um, public awareness is um, very important and helping to um, build the constituencies that are necessary in order to demand for action um, on air, air quality. So those are two basic things. And, and do you feel there is enough, uh, one of the questions from the chat, you know, do you feel there is enough um, resources being put into air quality management at the moment? You see, what I, what I would say to that is this. Um, global, you, I saw also that you had responded with, or some, Chris, I think, had responded with a, with a report saying, which says that globally, the results suggest that there is not enough financing. Um, from the World Bank's perspective, you know, the bank, as I was saying, has been trying to do a lot of supporting of air quality management um, and climate change mitigation actions over the years. And there has been quite a sizable amount of uh, resources that has gone into this, as I said earlier, about over $50 billion um, in those two decades, um, just from pollution and about um, $14 billion on air quality management. But there needs to be more done. Um, and the I cannot provide all the financing. We wish we could, um, but um, the countries also have to invest their own resources in this. And it's simply because, you know, it's not a question of just monitoring and that's the end of it. It's uh, there needs to be a long term sustained approach to actually being able to keep your air quality levels at um, concentrations that are um, not harmful to health. So governments have to be ready to make those investments in the long term. I mean, maybe related to that, uh, there is a question, you know, is this um, response to COVID-19, this um, massive global response, does that mean that the um, response to air pollution might get gain higher interest amongst people and amongst policymakers? I mean, Geraint, I was just wondering in the UK context, do you think that air pollution is going to go up the agenda because of of, of this interest in health impacts? Uh, well, it could do. It depends on how much the media take hold of it. Um, so far in Britain, there, there's been some analysis of, you know, why, for example, have BAME communities got higher incidence of uh, uh, air, COVID death? And clearly one of those is the fact that they live in more congested housing in more polluted areas. And this has been skirted around to a certain extent. Elements of the media have picked it up. But the issue really is, is joining the dots and letting people know and then people will respond. Obviously, they are concerned about air pollution in Britain, in particular in London. And in the mayoral election, it was the number one political issue. So it is beginning to take off. But we need to drive it forward by providing the data for for instance, parents outside schools, so that they all lobby the local council, so they won't be lobby, you know, idling outside, uh, you know, outside the schools waiting for children and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. The political pressure needs to be facilitated partly by the media giving the ammunition and the data being available for people to raise air quality up up the agenda. And COVID is is this particular moment in time. That we can use the appalling pandemic to our advantage, if you like, for both climate change and air quality. And um, what about in Mexico? As I understand it, Gerardo, air pollution is a major political issue um, there. And there are two questions, you know, so to what extent um, is, is there enough 
pressure on politicians to to react to air pollution and the the improvements that you've seen in Mexico City have they also been um, translated into action in other cities in in Mexico as well so if you could answer that please okay about about other cities and re just recently recently has been uh, a pollution has become a public issue in other cities before it was a problem of those living in the megalopolis but the, now uh, in, in other cities me medium sized and big cities in mexico uh, a pollution is is a, is a is an issue and also it has been increased by the covid uh, in, 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 in the first question about, uh, about, about the poor people and more exposure, more exposure to, to air pollution, I think there are three, three ways of doing it. One is regulation, let's say, uh, uh, for example, uh, quality of fuels, that's, and that's one. That's one. Uh, the other is like, like public transport policy, uh, is, is a public transport, especially electric public transport, might, might reduce quite a lot the exposure of, of the users of the of, of the transport. But there is a driver uh, underneath driver of, of all this that is is the the urban sprawl, uh, and that is due basically due to, due to the lack of a state policy on housing. And what what has happened um, for the last uh, let's say uh, fifteen years? Uh, the, uh, the state abandoned this government, not but previous government, abandoned uh, a public uh, policy uh, on, 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 on housing and uh, it was left to the market. So poor people go far away uh, and, and uh, the city was, as in other places, was, was, was um, being emptied. But then, so middle class goes far. Poor, poor people go farther away. So I, I think a, a, a state uh, public policy on housing that, uh, and pushing for a more integrated society, more, more integrated city where different social groups are able to live near together uh, might make us more resilient uh, and, and uh, more sustainable cities more livable cities. Uh, so I think I, I think there is a there is a great opportunity on, on, on that side. Thank you, Gerardo. So I was one of the other issues that's been brought up is the issue of um, you know making sure communities are represented, you know, the poor people have a voice. Um, Sarah, I, I don't know from your experience, where do you think that we need to put more effort? I think I think for me, what we really need to try and do is to try and yeah, give give people who don't have a voice, um, bring them into the research process. And there's lots and lots of ways that you can do that. Um, but we've, we've, there's been a bit of a chat going on in the question and answer session. And I think for me, it's how do you scale up those things? Because we've had some really um, interesting work done in SEO over the past kind of five years or so. Um, but how do you learn from that and encourage that learning between different spaces? So we can raise awareness of air pollution in a particular area. We can make some changes in a particular city. But then how does that you know, cascade across the world. This is a global problem um, yeah. that we need to solve. So I think for me, it's how do we encourage that um, learning between the policy makers, between the decision takers and between citizens in different places as well, because I think citizens do have a, a real power um, to try and enact change. Um, I don't know if Geraint has any um, experiences of that, but I think, you know, if, if the community drive towards something, they really want something, it often happens. I think you gave the example, Geraint, of um, you know, parents outside schools knowing something about the air quality and then campaigning to do something about it and I think trying to have those actions cascaded out so that they're happening across the world and having those those impacts will be therefore much greater so that's where I'd like to see a bit more focus is terms of how do movements happen how do things 
become from sort of one community raised awareness? How does that become a global movement for change? So maybe I can then just throw open a question to anyone who wants to answer it before asking Patrick to to sum up um, and give us some final reflections. And, and that is the one about, you know, we, we have today the United Nations International Day of Clean Air for Blue Skies. And how do we keep that momentum going rather than just sort of like bring it up once a year? I mean, actually having this focus is one way of keeping it going because it'll happen every year. Um, but, you know, could I just throw it out to anyone who wants to answer, how are we going to keep the momentum on air pollution going? Who would like to answer? Can I make a very quick comment? And, and that is clearly we need to be out there encouraging people to, uh, who care about this to write to their paper, to write, you know, get their neighbours, their friends, their communities to get engaged and get people to keep on talking about it uh, rather than just talking to themselves about it. And once people do know about it and their children are at risk in their own schools, whether it's indoors or outdoors, for example, um, and they want that to be, for example, their local council in the run of the local council election, that should be a policy that should, should be monitoring, et cetera, just keep on keeping on. And what you find is politicians, uh, you know, sadly, they just want to get reelected and be popular. And if they think that's something that pushes the right buttons, they'll listen. And if they're not told that, they'll just assume everybody loves driving around in their cars and, and sitting in congestion and the status quo. And uh, Helena, you had your hand up uh, briefly. Would you like to? Yeah, in addition to those wise words, yeah. uh, I just wanted to say, I think we what normally helps to create this kind of movements is to have some champions out there and, and to really celebrate what works. Uh, and, and it's like a snowball effect. No, you start with, there were some questions in the question and answers. How do you get cities to learn from each other? How do you get citizens to learn from each other? Industry to steal each other's, uh, you know, business models to make it effect effective, etc. So I think it's, it's it's really about visibility and it's about leadership and recognition of the leadership and also it's almost like shaming and blaming as well no you you have the on the one side the positive um, the, the, the the carrot and the stick and i think uh, having an international day is a good um it's something that's good to have uh, because we can uh, use it a lot in the international community to motivate and and also make this visible for those that are on the ground and might not get the visibility that's required. Uh, the, the second best would, of course, be to have some kind of a much more binding global effort, but maybe that's not something that is in, in the making very shortly, and we shouldn't think that that will also change. We have the Paris Agreement, uh, we, we signed it after 21 years of negotiations, and we have still not really started to operationalize it after 25, 26 years. So, I mean, we don't have that time. So everything now needs to be quick. And, and as we heard, politicians are not so long lived. So we also need those uh, fast kind of positive messages. So, so thank you very much, Helena. And so I'll, I'll, I'd like to turn now to Patrick Bucher from GIZ. And listening to all of these um, fascinating talks and, and the discussion, um, I'd like you to give us some reflections uh, of what you have heard and, and what you think. Yeah, thanks a lot, Johan. Um, it has been a really a fantastic um, 90 minutes now. Very informative, um, extremely, I think, extremely um, up to date, um, a very good overview of where we are at the moment. Um, I think it, it has been quite clear from all the presentations that there is no alternative to having a real big change. So building back better is actually uh, a real, um, let's say, I mean, there, there's no alternative to it. Uh, we have heard that we have to get away from uh, fossil fuels. We have to uh, think or start thinking about our diet. Um, I actually had never heard about the planetary health diet. So that is my take home message for today. Um, so I think we've heard a lot of really good um, information, uh, which I guess we expected as well to hear. Um, the thing is, you know, we, we heard that we need systemic change. And I think there is the real challenge. 
uh, I think it has been quite clear as well from the presentations that only if the governments and the different sectors and the individuals, the citizens work together, only together can we achieve really this vision we have of a better world, of a better and fairer world. And I think, um, you know, I would like to pick out some sectors as well that uh, have been, uh, and I can probably tell you what has been going on in Germany recently. So that there has been another uh, analysis in terms of which sectors have done uh, more and which have done less in terms of uh, climate change mitigation and as well air pollution reduction and uh, agriculture and building sectors have uh, come out as the worst sectors. So they really have to, to do their, uh, their share. Um, and I think um, together with government and individuals, we can then achieve this change. However, and that is something, and I really liked what Sarah said there as well, I think we have to think about, uh, about as well how to reach people. And I think we have to be very, uh, very realistic there. So there are certain people, both in governments, in the industry, in, you know, in, in the public, we won't be able to reach. We have to accept that there are certain people like, for example, Donald Trump, you will never, you will never be able to convince him that air pollution is a big issue. So, and I think we have to just accept that, but there are a lot of people who are still, who either don't know about it or who, who really can be, you know, persuaded that this is a really interesting and worthwhile subject. Mm -hmm. And I think there, uh, you know, we have to, to think more how to better reach out to people. And I think we need as well psychologists and sociologists to think about this. Uh, and I think one of the big problems, and this is the uncomfortable truth, I think, is that most of us who are highly educated have as well a very high income and we contribute most to climate change and to air pollution. And I think we have to lead by example as well. You know, we can't we can't go out uh, to those people who can who cannot afford to to spend their um, winter holidays in the Alps or the summer holidays somewhere, uh, even on a different continent, and just tell them, you know, what they have to do if we don't start uh, in our own back, uh, backyard. So I think we have to really start and be very honest with ourselves what we can do and how we can lead as well by example. Only if we can lead by example, we can as well persuade, I think, larger um, let's say larger parts of the society that at the moment don't have, uh, I mean, don't have a, a very large carbon footprint. Uh, and I think uh, we have to be very honest there. And I think, um, you know, coming back um, to- If you could wrap up, please. Yes, uh, to, to this day, I think uh, it is very important to have such a global day because we can reach out and we, we can raise awareness uh, for, for the issues. And I think that is really um, a very important function of this day. And I think we have to be positive. We heard that as well. Um, but we have to be as well honest. You know, we have to be really honest and, and tell people that there is a reduced time or let's say a limited time we can actually now push for this change, you know, building back better what is the time frame we have to, to build back better? And we have to be honest as well that we have to act now. And I think we all have together, you know, we have to act and we have to be honest and we have to bring scientists, the politicians and people from the different sectors together to, to uh, look for sustainable solutions that are just uh, environmentally friendly, uh, and as well, uh, I would say as well, from a political point of view, they have to be as well sustainable. So we, we need to, to, to as well, you know, we, we need to get those politicians, we have to elect those politicians who really believe in that change. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Patrick. So I would yeah. like to thank all of the speakers who have been fantastic today uh, in giving their um, talks and their responses. And also to all the participants, thank you very much for for joining us. And I think the next 10 years, the next 10 years are crucial for climate change to stop millions of people dying every year from air pollution. And so um, there is an urgency. So 
um, we can um, get together at the next clean air day, but we don't uh, we, we, we can't afford not to keep acting and doing all of the, the wise things that people have suggested um, in this webinar between now and then and going on for the next few years to try and achieve the goals that we want. So thank you very much. And I think we'll close uh, five minutes late. I hope that hasn't upset anybody's schedule. And thank you everyone for your participation.